Good evening, everyone. I'm Wanda Williams. I'm an archivist here at the National Archives of St. Louis, and I want to welcome you out to tonight's Documented Rights panel, examining Hispanic and Latino history. Tonight's panel is actually panel number six. Uh, we launched our Documented Rights lecture series in October. Uh, that's when we opened the exhibit that you see in the gallery to your right. And we've been going strong since. Uh, we want to uh, extend a thanks to all of the scholars. To date, we will have had probably close to about 20 scholars and experts from throughout the St. Louis uh, metropolitan area, Washington University, St. Louis University, uh, the University of Missouri at St. Louis, um, uh, just a, an expansive list of scholars who have donated their time to uh, educate the public and provide this wonderful public service to the community. Uh, we also want to thank, um, I want to thank all of our staff um, who have been critical in pulling these programs together. Teresa Fitzgerald, who's sitting in the back, has worked closely with me. Um, Bill Seibert and Nancy Schuster and Sarah Holmes and Susie Davis, and I could go on and on. Uh, a lot of people have uh, worked over the last uh, seven months to make uh, this series successful. We've probably had close to about a thousand people come through our doors, and uh, we're excited. This tonight is our last uh, full panel. Uh, next month we will have a panel, uh, not a panel, actually we're going to show a film on May the 24th at 7 p.m. Uh, commemorating Memorial Day and um, we're hoping to show uh, the film Why We Fight. We'll be joined again by Dr. Uh, John McManus, it's a military historian and uh, a local film critic as well and we'll examine how uh, war is portrayed uh, on the big screen. Um, as in the past, the monthly panels um, have been based on a theme taken from a document uh, in the exhibit. Uh, tonight's panel is no different. Uh, the document tonight, or the documents rather, we have a statement uh, from the Hernandez versus Corpus Christi case from the 1950s. This case involved Linda Hernandez, who was placed in a segregated Spanish-speaking class even though she did not speak English. The other document is actually a cover from a book uh, titled Concerning Segregation of Spanish-Speaking Children in Public Schools. This book also addresses the segregation of children with Spanish surnames. So tonight we'll talk about that, those documents, and we'll expand the conversation to include other topics uh, of relevance to the Hispanic and Latino community. The Documented Rights exhibit will end on May the 31st, next month. It's open between 11, the hours of 11 and 6, Monday through Friday, so uh, please come out and view what uh, is a collection of documents from more than 14 different locations around the country. These documents all offer a glimpse into the various civil and human rights struggles waged by different groups of Americans. You can also view the exhibit online at www.archives.gov. We are in the process of working on our next exhibit, which will open in 2013. Uh, the title, Through America's Lens, Focusing on the Greatest Generation. The time period will be 1920 to 1945. So we hope you will, some of you are returning, um, we hope you'll come out again next year and we hope to launch another lecture series as well. We have a box on the table um, for upcoming events, so if you're not on our email list, feel free to complete a form and we'll add you uh, to our email list. If you could please turn off your cell phones. Uh, we are being taped tonight. And with that, I will turn the podium over to our director, Brian McGraw. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. And good evening again, everyone. I want to thank you all for being here, and especially our panelists tonight. As uh, Wanda has mentioned, the Documented Rights Exhibit it contains many, many documents uh, chronologizing the, the trials and tribulations and struggles that many Americans faced uh, in their battle for equality. But here in St. Louis, in addition to this exhibit, we house more than 100 million <coughs> excuse me, military and civilian personnel records. Some of these are on display in documents uh, in the exhibit here tonight, uh, including the likes of Jackie Robinson, who went on from his military career to be to 
played professional baseball, including as well his court martial record because he refused to move to the back of the bus. A portion of which, this is all in the exhibit. Um, and as well, James Meredith, Air Force veteran who applied and was accepted to the University of Mississippi. And of course, once they found out he was a black male, they said, no, thank you. The National Archives has more than 40 locations throughout the United States. We are the largest location outside of the Washington, D.C. Beltway area. We have over 800 people here in St. Louis working every day to serve our nation's veterans, next of kin, genealogists, historians, and researchers. The building you're in is the newest building in the National Archives system. It's a product of seven years of labor of love for some folks to replace the aging facilities that we have in St. Louis that we're uh, required to replace to meet the standards that we have for federal records. This building is uh, on seven acres. It has the capacity to store over 2.2 million boxes of records. And we're rapidly approaching 1.7 million boxes of records as we speak right now, today. Uh, we are still moving at a, at a rate of 6,000 boxes every day. Uh, we're also a great resource for researchers interested in doing genealogy on family members that served in the military or in civil service. We'll be more than glad to entertain any questions at the end of tonight if, uh, if you have those about research or what we have here. Before our panelists start, we have some brief remarks from Dr. Catherine, Catherine Matthews, Director of Clinical Services at Casa de Salud. At Casa, she oversees the clinical operations and student internships and educational partnerships. She's also conducting a Missouri Foundation for Health funded two-year needs assessment among members of the region's Latino community. Dr. Matthews. Good evening. Welcome. I was asked to reflect on how this case makes us consider things that we face today. So for me to start, let me tell you a little bit about CASA. We're a healthcare organization and we specialize in serving newly arrived Spanish-speaking immigrants. Our purpose is to provide some care on site, but really to help people get into the broader system of care. And so when I was thinking about this evening, I thought about the concept of separate space. And I specifically thought back to the Plessy versus Ferguson case in the 19th century and the notion that you could have separate but equal. In my experience in healthcare, although I've only been with CASA about a year and a half, I've been in what we call the safety net system since I moved here in 1998. And so in healthcare, I see it continue to play out that we have separate systems for people who are poor or uninsured. And that begs the question for me about whether these are truly separate but equal systems. So I invite you to reflect on when we create separate spaces, what is the agenda? One of the things we're trying to do at CASA is to create a space that's welcoming and safe and respectful and yet then try to go with people as they enter into other spaces. And sometimes when we're going into healthcare organizations where either official policies or practice limit the kind of care that people can get, our role through advocates called navigators or through our referral coordinator is to open up that space again and make sure that as people travel, in this case with Hispanic surnames, from one part of the healthcare system to another, that they don't, everywhere they go, encounter a separate but limited space. So it's my pleasure to be here tonight, and I look forward to hearing what the panelists have to say, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. It's now my pleasure to introduce our panel's moderator for the program. Richard T. Middleton is a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. His research focuses on the intersection of race and ethnicity in the evolution of political power, law, political representation, and public policy. Dr. Middleton's research has appeared in numerous journals, including Political Research Quarterly, Social Identities, Pol Politics and Policy, and the Journal of Immigrant and Refugee Studies. He's the author of Cities, Mayors, and Race Relations, Task Forces as Agents of Race-Based Policy Innovations. Dr. Middleton is also a practicing attorney, licensed in the state of Missouri, and with the Federal District Court, Eastern District of Missouri. 
He has uh, conducted research on, le on complex legal issues of immigration, prepared immigration petitions for clients, and drafted continuing legal education materials on immigration law. He received his Juris Doctorate degree from the St. Louis University School of Law and a PhD in Political Science from the University of Missouri at Columbia. Dr. Middleton. Good evening and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening and tonight's panel is quite timely and quite salient and that is focusing on the rights of Latinos, Hispanics in the United States. If we look at the face of our nation's immigrant and we think of the sort of paradigmatic immigrant to the United States, turn of the 19th century, if we juxtapose that portrait to today's immigrant, the 21st century, the face of the immigrant to the United States has changed. And we can say that symbolically, but as well as ascriptive characteristics, phenotype, language. As a result of that, studies have found that by and large, the Latino population in our country is outpacing other demographic groups. The Latino population comprises roughly 16 to 17% of our country's population based upon recent uh, statistics published by the U.S. Census Bureau. Now, corresponding to this growth in the Hispanic population in the United States, some communities have begun to promulgate legislation aimed at addressing an immigrant problem. That is symbolic language, language that couches the notion of a Latino problem. And I say that not simply based upon anecdotal evidence, but statistical evidence. Uh, by and large, in the communities and states where legislation is being promulgated to address a so-called immigrant problem, uh, these states and communities are attempting to respond to a growth in the Latino population. We need only turn to Valley Park uh, within the past five to six years here in the state of Missouri in the St. Louis metropolitan area as evidence of that and comments that were made uh, by the former mayor there, Jeffrey Whitaker, as it relates to the growth of the Latino population uh, in Valley Park, Missouri. So we have to pay close attention to the uh, increase in legislation emanating from state and localities. Uh, these jurisdictions uh, are beginning to uh, encroach upon the very notion of basic human rights and civil rights of these uh, newcomers to these communities. And just yesterday, the U.S. Supreme Court began hearing arguments relative to a very important case, U.S. versus Arizona. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Arizona legislation. And that will be an important decision to pay close attention to because the court's holding in that case will really set a strong precedence for other state and locality measures, uh, ordinances, statutes that uh, touch upon the very same issues, regulating some facet of the lives of immigrants, uh, and again, largely Latino uh, newcomers to these communities. So without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists for tonight, uh, who I have uh, here on my left, your right. Uh, first, we have Kenneth Schmidt. Kenneth Schmidt is an attorney with the U.S. Legal Solutions Law Firm of St. Louis. He's practiced law since 1993, and today more than half of his legal cases deal with immigration law. Schmidt will discuss the history of discrimination against his Hispanic, excuse me, and Latino citizens in public education. U.S. Legal Solutions represents immigrant clients who appear before the Federal Immigration Court and before U.S. CIS. Schmidt is a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association and currently serves as the Missouri Kansas chapter elect and liaison between the chapter and the ICE district headquartered in Kansas City. He's also a member of the American Bar Association, the Missouri Bar Association, and the Illinois Bar Association. Uh, Attorney Schmidt earned his JD, Juris Doctor, uh, from St. Louis University School of Law in 1993, Masters of Arts in Public Administration from St. Louis University in 1993, and Bachelor of Arts in Biology. That's a pretty bad. Pre-med, <laughs> impressive, and political science from St. Louis University in 1989. Saw the light. What's that? Saw the light. Oh, he saw the light. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. 
Next, we have attorney Jesus Ituarte. Uh, attorney Ituarte is currently a practicing attorney with Ituarte and Associates LLC law firm in St. Louis. Uh, a Mexican immigrant, uh, attorney Ituarte will discuss his experience and challenges faced uh, by himself and his parents following their arrival from Mexico in 1978. His area of emphasis is civil and immigration law. He is a board member of St. Cecilia School and the former publisher of La Voz, a bi-weekly Spanish and English newspaper. Attorney Ituarte graduated from St. Louis University School of Law in 1994, and he is a good friend of my in-laws who also are from Mexico. <laughs> Next, we have attorney uh, and professor John Ammon, who is also a colleague of mine and a dear friend. Uh, professor Attorney Ammon is an attorney and director of the St. Louis University Legal Clinics, a very, very uh, important service uh, and institution here in the city of St. Louis in the metropolitan area. The clinics provide legal services to persons with low income, to government agencies, and to nonprofit organizations. Professor Ammon will discuss the clinic's role in assisting immigrants in the St. Louis metropolitan area. In 1994, Professor Ammon joined the SLU faculty and has directed numerous legal clinics offered at the law school specializing in litigation, civil rights, real estate, housing, and finance, as well as immigration law, very important immigration matters. Professor Ammon earned his law degree from St. Louis University School of Law in 1984. SLU is well represented here today. <laughs> he graduated in the top 10% of his graduating class. He is the recipient of the Thomas J. White Family Fellowship in Public Law and Government and the White Family Scholarship. In addition to serving as the director of the SLU Law Legal Clinics, Professor Ammon served as the senior editor of the American Bar Association's Journal of Affordable Housing and Community Development Law from 2003 to 2005. Professor Ammon is the recipient of SLU's Faculty Member of the Year Award in 2003, the Governor's Excellence in Teaching Award 2003, and the 2008 Lawyer of the Year Award for his work in resolving a delay and the naturalization cases of 80 Bosnian immigrants. And last but certainly not least, the pleasure of introducing Christine Wallentick. She's a staff attorney with the Catholic Legal Assistance Ministry Immigration Law Project, yet another very important organization in our metropolitan area. Attorney Wallentick will discuss the types of services provided by her organization. She joined the project in 2001 and works with a team of lawyers who provide legal assistance for family-based and non-employment immigration cases. Attorney Wallentick represents and assists clients with a wide range of immigration-related legal challenges. She's also an advocate for victims of crime and human trafficking. She provides Know Your Rights training sessions throughout the St. Louis metropolitan area to educate non-citizens and citizens about their constitutional rights and immigration and the immigration process. Wallentick earned her JD from the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, a master's in public policy from the University of Denver Institute for Public Policy, and a bachelor of arts in political, and, excuse me, in politics and international studies from Fairfield University. Now each panelist will have 15 minutes to present and after all of the presentations have concluded, we will open the floor for discussion as well as question and answer session. So I'd like to ask our first panelist to come forward, and that is Attorney Kenneth Schmidt. Thank you, Dr. Milton. Um, <clears throat> in preparing my, my comments for today, I took a look at the materials and the, the cases cited, um, there's a Mendez case, Mendez versus the state of California, Delgado <clears throat> versus the state of um, Texas, and the Hernandez case versus Corpus Christi, which is referenced in the, in the document, which is kind of the centerpiece around which this program is, is focused. <clears throat> and to get an understanding of what are these uh, issues, what are these um, challenges that are, have been litigated that are, are kind of the theme for what we're here to talk about. And, and, and clearly, and as I think has already been expressed, it's a, it's, a, it's a theme of integration of our immigrant community into the community as a whole, and the hurdles that have been put up historically um, to that, that integration. <clears throat> the uh, Mendez and the Delgado cases actually go back to the 1940s. These are pre-Brown versus Board of Education cases. 
And as I, I reflected more on what I wanted to say tonight, the topics that I'm, I've agreed to talk about, I thought there's a certain irony. Um, we're here talking about the historic um, hurdles that the immigrant community has had put in front of them in, 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 in their attempts and their, their drive to integrate into our community, become part of this great country that we are. And yet, <clears throat> if you reflect back to 2008 and you reflect back on this immigration debate we've been having in this country for the last 10 years, <clears throat> and I've had occasion to do that because an individual by the name of Tom Tancredo will be coming to St. Louis U on the 22nd, I think, to be part of a speaker panel. And I wanted to do some research on where he, you know, what his actual positions were. You may remember him. He ran for the presidential nomination of the Republican Party in, in 2008. And so as, as I did some research on what his position was and what were the arguments he was making, I found it really ironic that this was the man who was building his campaign, um, his, his primary campaign, on the argument that these immigrant groups, this immigrant problem, is a problem because they don't want to integrate. They resist integration. They segregate from our community as a whole. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Because the struggle, when, when you strip away the rhetoric, the struggle of our immigrant community, whether you're talking about the Latino community today or in 1940s, or you're talking about any other of the Chinese immigrant community, any other Bosnia, any of the immigrant communities, look around, we have them even here in St. Louis in the heartland. Their struggle has always been, to, how can I become part of this American dream? And isn't that just kind of interesting? And, I, and I, obviously, you can look at me, I don't have any personal experience from that, other than the work we do with our clients every day. I think Mr. Duarte will be able to speak more on that. But it's, it was, it's just an interesting dichotomy between the rhetoric and the reality that we, that we live in in the last 10 years. So anyway, what I thought I would talk about today, um, and, and actually one more point about the, the, the immigrant problem, the immigration problem that we have, how ironic we hear about that in the state of Missouri. We have 3% roughly estimated uh, of a Latino population in the state of Missouri, maybe 6% in the metropolitan St. Louis problem. So I don't know what the problem is that's identified. And, and when you strip away that rhetoric, I think it's interesting to know, we're not talking about a Missouri problem that needs a Missouri solution, and that's why we see things in Jefferson City happening. We're looking at a nationwide political movement led by certain individuals that started off with, with Oklahoma and passing a statute there, the state of Missouri in 2008 and passing our statute here, and then Arizona, Alabama, Georgia, and all the other states so it's just, I think it's important if we're going to talk about these things, you're able to identify the rhetoric for what it is and get it out of the way and talk about the reality. And so <clears throat> in the short time I have left, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what state hurdles, um, current state law hurdles immigrants may have in, in, in the state of Missouri in integrating in the public school system since that's what, what we, um, uh, since that's the case, the documents that we're talking about kind of stem out of as well as also on the federal level. And then uh, talk a little bit about Senate Bill 590, which is pending in the Missouri legislature right now, which would perhaps exasperate some of that. And I thought I'd balance that out a little bit with um, a discussion of what the DREAM Act is um, so that you know, we all hear about that, maybe, maybe talk a little bit about that as maybe more of a positive uh, uh, solution to some of these problems. So in 2008, um, we had an uh, immigration omnibus bill, a, a bunch of different pieces of legislation put together and passed. Um, it's, it's known as Senate Bill 1549. And the, the provisions in that bill that kind of impact public education are really more geared towards college education. And I don't know that when that legislation was passed, it was, it was intended or identified as, as keep undocumented individuals out of our public colleges type of provision, but that's the way it's actually been, uh, has, has come down and, and, and actually is given effect. So the public benefits provision of 1549 says that no undocumented person, or no person here unlawfully, can receive any public benefit. And in the way it's, it's been defined, that has been interpreted to mean you cannot attend an, an, uh, a public uh, college. We saw uh, initially uh, the issue arose with uh, AMSOL and registration and then asking for, well, where's your evidence that you've been, that you're here lawfully? Where's your documentation? Um, there was some back and forth and, 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 and discussion about that. And I think ultimately um, the public schools, the, the public colleges has, 
have taken the position that you cannot register for school if you cannot demonstrate you're lawfully present. On the federal level, um, in 1996, there was a, uh, a very restrictive set of amendments to the Immigration Naturalization Act. We call it IRA IRA. It's the Illegal Immigrant Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. And one of the kind of sneaky provisions in that um, went to, and, 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 I, and I just find this ironic too, that you always hear on the other side of the debate to talk about federalism, states' rights, the state should be able to do what it wants. But they liked IRA IRA, and IRA IRA had the provision that said, states, by the way, when you're accepting students into your schools and you may have um, in-state tuition versus out-of-state tuition, we, the federal government, are going to tell you you're not allowed if, to give in-state tuition breaks or the reduced tuition to an undocumented person. You have to charge them out-of-state tuition if you're going to accept them. Um, that has been the law since 1990. It's been the federal law since 1996. Now, I tell you, many, many states thumb their nose at that. Um, for instance, Texas will accept undocumented students um, at the in-state tuition rate. There's Missouri hasn't, but um, other states have, have essentially ignored that. But that, that, that is you know, another hurdle to the, op the educational opportunities of uh, individuals, and we're talking about undocumented individuals here, but still their drive to, to, to integrate into our communities, and we all know that education is, is the route to make that happen. Now, currently, we have, um, everybody's heard about the Arizona statute, and we, we had oral arguments before the Supreme Court yesterday on that. Um, one of the copycats of the Arizona statute, or a kind of, you know, one of the, um, in, in large way it was a copycat, and, and, and it was enhanced in some, some respects, was the state of Alabama's uh, uh, House Bill 56, which passed last year. Um, like the Arizona statute, much, several portions of the Alabama statute have been enjoined, in other words, the Federal courts have said you can't enforce those until we litigate further the issues. One of the, one of the uh, provisions, one of the enhancements between the Arizona statute and in, 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 in the Alabama statute, one of the additional hurdles that are placed in the Alabama statute is the public school um, registration provisions that deal with registration, registering of K through 12 students in their public school system. The Alabama statute requires um, that it, it, it requires, I'm going to read this because I want to make sure. We've now, there's a bill now pending in Missouri to copy this. And it's word for word cut and paste. Again, when I say this is a national movement, this is not somebody, well, this, you can see the national scope of this, this, uh, this movement. But the bill requires that when, at the time of enrollment, um, the school will determine whether student enrolling was, one, either born outside the United States or is the child of an alien not present, lawfully present in the United States. So effectively, the bill enacted in Alabama and the bill that has been, the language has been copied into um, the Missouri pending legislation requires the student, the, the school authorities to identify really the, 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 the the, the, uh, whether or not the parents are, are unlawfully present in the United States and report that to the school board, which is reported to the state, which is essentially kept confidential except for the purpose of sharing information with the federal government. We all know if you watch this, the, the news what happened when school opened up in several counties in Alabama. We had an exodus of students. And, um, and we're not talking, on, now we're not talking just about undocumented students. We're talking about U.S. citizen children whose parents are undocumented. That language has been copycatted, cut and pasted. It is pending in the Missouri legislature right now. It's Senate Bill 590. It's been uh, reported out of committee as in favor of passing it. It has not been put on a calendar in the Senate floor. Um, and we all know the legislature is required to conclude its business by May 18th. So we have about three weeks to see if that will make it through the rest of the, the hurdles. Um, I have only a couple of minutes remaining. The DREAM Act, which would ameliorate a lot of this, allows a benefit to undocumented children and undocumented young adults who were brought here, and it depends on what version of it you're looking at, this is federal legislation, but would allow them, if they were brought here under the age of 15, if they're less than 35 years old now, 
if they've completed high school or gotten a GED, if they have um, registered and have been accepted and completed two years of college or gone to the military. It would allow them an opportunity, even though they were brought here probably by their parents without permission and they have no status now, it would allow these individuals an opportunity to obtain status and eventually go on the road to, if they maintain that status conditionally first, have the conditions removed, and then eventually apply for citizenship. So these people who have done nothing wrong, because you, when you're five years old, when you're two years old, you don't make the decision. Your parents brought, their parents brought them here. And they've demonstrated their, their value to the community. They're educated. They've done everything we expect a good community member to do as a child, as a young adult. We give them the opportunity to at least now integrate into our communities. I think I'm out of town. So I'll go. Thank you very much, Ken. Now we will have Attorney Jesus Torte. He will speak on his experiences and his family's experiences as an immigrant from Mexico. Thank you, Professor. Uh, before I start, uh, would you mind uh, if I ask a few questions of the audience? Uh, has anybody in the audience ever uh, left and traveled outside of the U.S.? Show of hands. Has anybody in the audience ever traveled outside the U.S. without any money? Okay, one on one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, to put this in context, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I, 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 I guess I got to apologize for being part of the problem that we have in the U.S. now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, to put this in context, uh, when I was asked to speak, uh, I asked, "What would you like me to speak about?" and and you know, they told me, well, talk about your experiences and coming to the U.S. and so on. And uh, you know, sometimes I don't like talking about that so much. It's uh, it's a little bit embarrassing. It's a little bit uh, odd, and it's it's something that we don't talk about it too much in public. But you know, why not? I'm always game on. So so within the context is of the people that I know, the people from you know, because you got to figure. Uh, Immigrants come in all shapes and, and sizes and colors and so on. Uh, we've got immigration is, is a broad spectrum that has a lot of different ways for people to come to the U.S. You can be a professional, you can be an athlete, you can be a politician, you can have a certain skill though that the U.S. will embrace you and let you come in. Uh, there are other ways to come in. Uh, if you have a family member in the U.S., you can have a family member sponsor you to come to the U.S. Uh, you can have brother, sister, and so on. Uh, or you can be a refugee, I mean, just not nice. Uh, or you can seek political asylum in different ways. But I think uh, my experience has been with the people that don't fit into any of those categories. Um, for the kind of people that, that I know, there is no way for people to come. There are no applications to be filed. There's no way for them to file documents and come in the legal way, as people call it. So th there really isn't anything for them. And, and people come because, uh, and this is just my experience, I, I, I don't seek to speak for anybody, but, but people come because people are desperate, okay? When I was a kid, I remember, I don't know, I was maybe, oh God, eight, nine years old maybe. And I remember playing outside my street in their home, and it's a dusty little street, and, and you know, we had skinny dogs running all over the place, roaming, trying to find a bone or something, and, and they never could. But I remember seeing my dad walking down the street, and my dad a, was a big, you know, good-looking guy, and I think I took his jeans off. <laughs> <laughs> and he came down, and he had a scruffy beard, and he looked dirty, and his shoes were all torn up and so on. Um, later on, I found out that my dad, when he first came to the U.S., walked 13 days across the mountains to get here. You know, he, he crossed at the El Paso Juarez border, and he and two other guys had never been to the U.S. and they didn't know anybody, they didn't speak English, any money. They just knew that they were, they were, there was work up here, so they came up. And the first time they came up, they walked across the desert and, you know, they p ate whatever they could along the way and, and picked it up. And immigration caught them on the 14th day and sent them back. And, you know, my dad came home a little defeated, quite defeated actually, you know. and, and I don't know, within a couple of months, he dusted off his clothes and did it again. Uh, the second time, he and the same two guys that, that left uh, jumped on the top of a freight train 
in, in Texas, outside El Paso. And uh, they, they were on top of the train, and there's no food or water on it. And the train stopped, what my dad says was Kansas City, but he's not sure. So he said the train stopped, and they got off the train, and they didn't know what to do or where to go. So they, they just walked. And somehow they ended up on Highway 70. And, you know, this stuff just happens as coincidence does all the time. That a Mexican guy that was coming to St. Louis from Kansas City saw him and picked him up. And that man uh, ran and owned a restaurant in North County okay. called the Hacienda Restaurant. Mm -hmm. So he brought him in and, and gave my dad a job. This is 19, God, 1970 maybe. And my dad and the other two friends worked. And they were there for a while. Uh, about eight years later, about 1978, my dad sat us all in the kitchen at home in Mexico. And my dad would work and, and he would go home for two, three months, come back. And he would do that all the time, send money and so on. But one day he wanted us to go to be with him here in the U.S. So he, uh, he, he sat us in the kitchen and, uh, and told us, he said, you know, guys, we're going to a different place, which is here. He said, uh, it's very different than home, and it's not, it's not nice like home. It's kind of bad. He said, but you guys know what good and bad is, so I expect good. And, and we came to St. Louis. Uh, none of us wanted to come to St. Louis. Uh, and I think that most people that end up coming here to the U.S. are people that are forced to come out. Nobody wants to leave home. You know, where you're loved and wanted. And, you know, I, I was reminiscing with, with Ken because uh, my wife is now into chickens. So now we have chickens at home. And I'm thinking, my God, you know, I, I can't go back, you know. I, I, I want to succeed, you know. And going back is, you know, I, wa I don't want to be an immigrant anymore. So, <laughs> but anyway, we, we drove, my dad drove us from Mexico. I'm from a place called Chihuahua, north central Mexico. And it took us about a day and a half to get here. And my parents are, you know, poor and and they're also cheap. So, <laughs> so on our trips, they had a cooler with food, and, 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 and we never stopped at a restaurant. I, I, think I, I think the first time I ate at a restaurant, I was maybe 15 or 16. We just never ate at restaurants. But we cried, all of us cried from Chihuahua to St. Louis. And when we arrived in St. Louis, God, this is late summer. I was 14 going on 15. And uh, you know, we, we didn't know where we were, and my dad had a, had a basement from his family they were going to live in. So the following day, I got up, I stuck my hat at the window, and all I could see was black asphalt everywhere and red brick buildings. And I thought, how, how odd, and no one's outside, you know, which is really weird, because back where I'm from, people are outside all the time. People just live out outside. And that was odd, and, and uh, I had never seen a black person before until we moved to St. Louis. So, so soon after we arrived, the question became, well, where are you guys going to go to school? So my dad said, I don't know, <laughs> I speak English. So. so I ended up going to a place called Roosevelt High School, which is South City. I don't know if anybody knows it or not, but, but now, and you know, my, I'm going to give my daughter a tour of the high school because they have metal detectors, and, and I want her to be shocked about that, make sure she stays in school. But um, it, it was, you know, for me, that experience was very, it's a hard experience. It was funny. Um, I didn't know in, in Mexico the school I attended was a federal school. Uh, we we have a lot of kids in Mexico, or had a lot of kids. I don't know at the time, but uh, most schools where we we're from had a two shifts: had the morning shift and the evening shift. So the kids would go to class from 7:30 to about 1, 1:30, go home, and then the people clean the buildings and. And about three to nine, the second set of kids come in and use the same building. So you've got a lot of kids. And, uh, you know, so you never ate in school. So I, I didn't know in Roosevelt that you could eat lunch in school. So I, I had a class on the third floor, and the doorbell, you know, the, the, the alarm went off, the thing rang. And I could see all the kids running down into the, <laughs> into the cafeteria that I didn't know. So I just sat there, and I think it took me about two weeks to figure out that you could eat at the school. I didn't know you could. So. And, you know, and then once you figure out what uh, that you can eat, then then you deal with, well, how do you eat or what do you eat? Because, you know, we don't have any money and so on. So uh, 
I was given a, a meal card back in the time. They punch it for you, you eat and check and so on. It's kind of fun. Um, the, I think the thing that saved me in school, uh, I, I think out of my graduating class in high school in Roosevelt, I think about 8% of the class went on to college. And I think maybe 4% graduate of college, right? And uh, I, I think the one thing that saved me was that I had a very solid, uh, basic uh, education from Mexico. Uh, we were doing uh, chemistry in seventh grade. We started doing physics in seventh grade, uh, heavily math and so on. So I, I, I'd seen, even when I was in high school, the math we were seeing in high school there at Roosevelt, I'd seen it in seventh grade before, which, which was great for me. But, uh, but um, you know, that experience is always hard because uh, now we see, and, and luckily for me, I've been very fortunate. Uh, uh, I've had a family that's very, it pushes a lot of people, always school, school education and so on. And, uh, and uh, I've been super fortunate, but I'm seeing a lot of people, not just Mexicans, but people from all over the world now, come in and, and have similar problems as I did. But it seems to me that, that when I came to the U.S., it seemed that, that maybe life in the U.S. for immigrants was a little more innocent, and, and you weren't the object of, of ridicule or, you know, persecution and so on and so on. Um, I'm not married. I have three, uh, three kids. I've got a 12-year-old daughter, a 10- and 8-year-old boy. And my daughter, when she was young, um, she, you know, my wife is Irish, Danish, I think, so she's whiter as white can be. <laughs> so, so my kids like to think that they're, they like to say that they're half, half Irish, half Danish, and a little Mexican. So <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I, no. But I tell my daughter, look, honey, you have a mustache, so you got to think that one more. So. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. I do say that to my daughter, by the way. But, uh, but uh, you know, now it seems that, that, that we're getting attacked from all over the place. And, you know, without going into the politics of it, uh, it, it isn't nice. Um, a lot of it, uh, you know, some of it is brought on to us by ourselves, by some of our clients behave badly sometimes. Uh, uh, some of them do things they shouldn't be doing. But I think overall, for the most part, people are, are good-hearted. They work hard. And, uh, and and just for the, you know, for the sake of this, I, I just don't see how any state in the U.S. would benefit from not allowing the kids to study. Uh, I'm on the board of uh, the school board of St. Cecilia. St. Cecilia is a, uh, is, which is now the Mexican school in St. Louis. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or not. Uh, uh, about five years ago, St. Cecilia was about to close, and a group called Access, which is a couple of wealthy guys, uh, uh, John Vatera, the Vatera family and so on, came up and they said, hey guys, if you teach the way we want you to teach, we'll fund school for you and uh, and and pay for the whole thing. So they did. And and one of the problems we have is that a lot of our kids come from backgrounds that don't have a school basic schooling education. So when they come, or their parents don't go to school either, and they don't know the value of education, they don't know what to do or how to do. And when they come up, kids end up dropping out of school, left and right. And some of them don't even make it to high school, which to me is, is a total, complete travesty. But uh, in St. Cecilia's, we're, we have this deal now that when we graduate a class of kids, and this year we've got 22 students graduating, and when they graduate, we've got a, a, a network with the, uh, the school college prep high schools that take the kids on scholarships. So Vianney will take a couple of kids, Shamina takes a couple of kids, Slu takes a couple of kids, uh, Rosati will take some and so on. And, and we're seeing some of our kids now, now going to college. I made the wrong time. <laughs> So we're seeing our kids going to college, and you know we've got some great kids and some smart little kids, but uh, we're coming up to the fact that a lot of them don't have legal documentation to be here. They're you know illegal aliens or undocumented or you know or mojados as we say. But and the problem is that the kids want to study, they want to go on, and, and and there's just no way for them to 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 continue. And that's really sad because I, I don't know how any state would benefit by not having. The, uh, the, the students or the kids better themselves. And the other thing we see a lot in my office is uh, the, 
in the undocumented become people to prey on by a lot of different people, not just employers, but you know we see uh, policemen really, really, really do severe things to them and the way they treat them, the way they stop them, and you know when when we get when when we get you know. Heck, when I get a traffic ticket, I left at the cop. You know, I, I tell them, you're gonna give, give me another one. You know, that's yeah, all you got, yeah. and so on. <laughs> but to these poor people, you know, a simple ticket for not having a license can be, you know, it changes their lives. You know, these poor guys are, you know, they go to work and they're going home, and suddenly they get pulled over because their license plate light is off. Uh, they don't have a driver's license, so they get stopped, arrested. You know, ICE comes in, and, and before they know it, they're in jail here, there, and. There's a bond of you know three thousand dollars, five grand, ten grand, and you know you got these poor families that now are even poorer because they can't bond the debt out. And and I don't know what's going to happen with this. You know, I, I don't know. I think it's it's our growing pains in the U.S. And I hope I, I hope that soon enough I'm going to have more kids so we can take over the U.S. and, and make more <laughs> dominant. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Orte. Our next panelist is Professor John Ammon from the St. Louis University School of Law Legal Clinic. Thank you. I'm honored to be in, in uh, front of you tonight and, and with this great panel. Um, I don't know a lot of things for sure about the immigration debate, but what I can tell you for sure is that St. Louis is a better place because the Duarte family moved here from Mexico. Um, people like Jesus are leaders in the Hispanic community, and we're a richer community because his dad and mom made the sacrifice to bring the family here. Um, Jesus started out with a question about driving. I'm going to have the same thing. So a lot of you have been overseas or out of the country, right? How many of you, when you were outside the country, drove a car in that other country? Okay. Now, did you take the test in the language of the country you were in before you started driving, or did you just get the car and drive? Nobody took a test, right? Did you take a test? You did. What was that? Oh, okay. Oh, I've never had that before. It's always the difficult one in the crowd. One of the bills in the Missouri legislature this year says that anybody taking a driver's test in Missouri has to take it in English. We've already passed it for commercial drivers, but now it would be for anybody driving a, a vehicle here. But but we could go to Mexico next week on a trip, right? Hop in a car and, and drive without taking a test or anything. Now, I know you'd be a tourist and all that, and I understand the difference. But part of what I want to talk about tonight is, is the double standards we face. Um, in this immigration debate. So so that's one of them. You know, we want everybody who drives in Missouri to take the test in English, but um, but that only applies, you know, to, to certain people. Um, I had the experience, um, all of us up here have dealt with municipal court. And for a lot of us, that's where we see the real problem with police and racial profiling of, of immigrant families. And let's agree on one thing tonight, that we will never use the word illegal alien again in any conversations about this. Even the U.S. Supreme Court now has gone to using undocumented persons. Um, and I know some of you are people of faith. You know, a person cannot be illegal. Okay? An illegal person does not exist. That should not be in our vocabulary. So undocumented person is the, is the appropriate way to, to discuss this. Um, but we deal with municipal court, and in St. Louis County, it's usually night court. I run into Ken and Jesus all the time in night court. And, and I was in traffic court. Some of you have been there, unfortunately, right? Um, in Ladue. This is several years ago, and I hadn't been out there before. And the room was about this size over here. And 90% of the people in the room had brown skin. They looked like Jesus. I'm like, I don't get it. This is Ladue. I was expecting rich white people who were driving the Mercedes a little too fast, you know. So one of the other attorneys was there, and I said, I'm, I'm just missing it. Why are all these Hispanic people in here? And he said, don't you get it? These are the gardeners and the maids and the domestic workers who work for the rich people in Ladue, 
and get pulled over by the Ladue police officers because they're committing the crime of driving while brown. Okay? And, and it dawned on me, it's like, it, you know, 90% of that room was, was Hispanics. And it has to be racial profiling in, in those circumstances. And there's statistics from the Attorney General about racial profiling and, and how that it's a, um, a, a real problem. Um, and lots of, I'm not just picking on the do, lots of cities have issues with, uh, with, with problems with, with targeting uh, Hispanics when they pull them over. Um, but, but it's a severe problem. Um, let me give you another story. Uh, Christmas of 2009. Haitians living in the United States, tens of thousands of Haitians living in the United States, undocumented, okay? They're driving to midnight mass. Most Haitians are Catholic, right? Driving to midnight mass in the United States, driving just at the speed limit and not over because if you get pulled over and you don't have a license and you're not documented, you're in trouble. So they're driving, you know, right at the speed limit, looking over their shoulder, don't want to get picked up, and living in constant fear, with which a lot of immigrants do. A month later, those tens of thousands of Haitians have clear legal status in the United States. They can now go to work. They can now apply for benefits. Their kids can go to American schools. What happened? An earthquake that killed 220,000 people. That's what happened. Within two days of the earthquake, the Department of Homeland Security, the United States government, gave Haitians living here illegally temporary protected status. Chris is going to talk a little bit more about that. For humanitarian reasons, we gave them permission to be here legally for an extended period of time. It was the right thing to do. Did anybody object? Did you hear Mitt Romney screaming that we can't let those Haitians in? No, there was nobody opposed to it, right? There was nobody opposed to it that I heard. Um, you agree with that? I agree. All right. <laughs> Had to check with the expert here. Um, but we gave them temporary protected status, and, and they became legal residents. Um, there are many parts of the immigration code that have humanitarian aspects to it. And, and I've argued that what we should be doing is just expanding those humanitarian ac uh, aspects. Asylum, you know, other refugee status, other protected statuses. The biggest problem with Mexico, right, Central America, is the numbers. Now, there are people in Mexico who have better humanitarian reasons for coming here than even some of the Haitians, right? Families in Mexico, and I'm not trying to stereotype what's happening in Mexico, right? But the drug dealers in some towns, Jesus can argue with me and, or correct me if he wants, in some towns the drug dealers have taken over, family members are being beheaded, family members are being killed, families are living in fear, not to mention the economic crisis, you know, and the, and, and, and the poverty. Why don't we use our humanitarian efforts and grant legal status to people from Mexico? Well, part of it is just the sheer numbers, right? Uh, we showed compassion to the Bosnians. We, you know, if you, were, if, if you were from Syria and came to the United States tomorrow, we'd give you protected status, you know, because of the problems in Syria. Um, so we have humanitarian aspects of it, but we just, we can't absorb the numbers, and I haven't solved that problem yet. But, but. You know, we can't say, well, let the Haitians stay, let the Bosnians stay, Mexicans, nah, I don't think so. What, what's the difference? What's the problem? And, and Jesus and Ken have talked about it. You know, the people who will tell you, we're not opposed to immigration, we're just opposed to illegal immigration. Tell them to go home and do it the right way. And as Jesus has indicated, it, it can't be done, right? I mean, if you don't have any employer here and you don't have any family in the United States to sponsor you and bring you over, what would the wait be today if you were in Mexico trying to get here? 20 years? 25 years? If, if you could even do it. If you qualify for a certain category. Like if you qualify. But it, it, it could be decades, right? So to tell somebody, oh, just do it legally, like you could go back and come back next week, doesn't work that way. You know, Mitt Romney saying self-deport and then come back legally. It's not a practical solution. Our program tonight 
um, is about documented rights. And I want to make an argument, being from Singlish University, a religious institution, I, I can use that pulpit a little bit to talk about documented rights, not only in the U.S. Constitution and American law, but from a religious standpoint. What is one of the few things that all the major world religions agree on? The rights of immigrants. Welcome the stranger, right? Christ said, I was a stranger and you welcomed welcome me. Every major world religion, Judaism, Hinduism, Muslims, every major religion says, welcome the stranger. Why? Because the stranger at your door, the stranger at the border, may be God himself. And I would submit, it is God, right? So from the religious standpoint, if we're talking about documented rights, Every major world religion has documented in their religious teachings that strangers, immigrants, have rights and you should accept them as your neighbor. Okay. Now, the, the caveat to that is you won't hear what I just said in any of the presidential debates. Okay. That's not, that's not part of our political discussion um, for obvious reasons. But I think religious institutions have a huge role to play. Dr. Matthews and the great work she's doing at CASA, you don't ask for paperwork from the patients. They don't check the legal status of people coming for medical care. Why are we telling school principals that they have to check? Okay. So again, religious-based institutions um, uh, will have a role to play in bringing some compassion to the debate. That's, that's one thing you don't hear in this debate is the compassion humanitarianism. It's all about closing the borders and, and and keeping people out. Um, just the last point I want to make about the double standards. Um, and, and Ken talked a lot about the legislation in Missouri and that sort of thing. Think about what just happened in 2010. What did we have in this country? We had the U.S. Census. What happens during the census in every community, in every state? Have you ever heard of any municipal government or state that doesn't want more residents? Okay. During the census, we try to count every we try to count people in prison and the homeless shelters. We want every warm body we can. Why? Because we get federal assistance that way and everything else. Okay. To me, this proves the racist portions of the immigration debate, right? Because Valley Park. Jesus and I were involved in a lawsuit challenging the law in Valley Park. Ken and I were part of a group challenging actions in the city of St. Anne where they were targeting Hispanics. I can tell you that St. Anne and Valley Park during the census wanted to count every resident. They want more people in their borders. Just not those people. Right? We want to count everybody. We want to grow. We want to have more people within our borders but not those people. And that's the problem with some of the things that are happening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Emmon. And our last panelist is Christine Walentic. Uh, she is staff attorney with Catholic Legal Assistance Ministry Immigration Law Project. Thank you. Thanks for um, inviting me to be here tonight. Um, I was asked just to talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day stuff, uh, working with Hispanics with the immigrant population in general. As we've heard already, we've heard about the policy um, arguments and about immigrants coming here, but what happens if people are trying to get their status in this country? So um, as I said, I'm with the Catholic Immigration Law Project, and we're an agency through Catholic Charities, um, and we represent anybody who's looking for help with an immigration case regardless of their status. So they can be undocumented um, or they can have their residency or trying to get their citizenship. We help people naturalize. Um, and we do both affirmative and defensive cases. But our biggest thing is that we work with just low income. So you have to have a certain, we have a, uh, income guidelines that we try to work with those people that can't afford the attorneys, the private attorneys to fight their cases, whether it be in deportation proceedings, whether the, they have to go in front of an immigration judge, or if they're just trying to uh, get their family to come here, they've been in the United States, they're applying for their family, 
or they've been other, some other way that they are able to apply for a benefit. So we kind of do the whole spectrum. The only thing we don't do is employment law and temporary visas. Because usually if you're coming here um, temporarily or if you have coming through an employer, they have the money to pay for the private attorney. So uh, as we were talking about, I, we've talked a lot about the negative parts of immigration law and the hard parts. And, you know, we do have to have a lot of people come to our office and we have to tell them there's nothing that we can do for their case. We just tell them keep staying here, you know, stay under the radar, don't drive in certain locations where we know the police are more likely to pass, stop them. Um, we have to kind of give warnings to them and we say, just keep living your lives, be here once you're here longer, like more than 10 years. Sometimes there's ways for people to fight their cases if they do get picked up, but we have to tell them the realities. Uh, but there are some humanitarian reasons, as John mentioned, of ways for people to stay in this country or to get status and where our immigration laws are actually encouraging people to come forward. Okay, and most of this time it's gonna be people who are victims of, of crimes, some sort of violence. Um, with, we have victims of crime, anybody who assists the police with the, with, their, um, with the investigation of someone. Our immigration laws really want to encourage people to not be afraid to call the police. If they're the victim of a crime or if they see a crime, they can be part of it if they're a family member. They want them to call the police so the police can prosecute these people. For, it's for a safety issue. So they will give temporary, they'll give visas um, and give people a path towards their residency and then their citizenship if they can help the police. Also victims of human trafficking, which has become a new thing probably over the last couple decades. It's been more popular. These are people who have been either labor trafficked or sex trafficked into the country or once they're in the country, they're taken advantage of, their employers are using um, fraud, force, or co coercion, um, and they, they want to come forward and get out of the situation where they're not, they're not being paid or they're being threatened that they're going to have ICE called on them if they don't keep working for little pay or several hours. Um, and then also victims of uh, domestic violence. So if you're a spouse, if you have a spouse who's a lawful permanent resident or a citizen and you've been the victim of domestic violence, you can apply for your residency. They want to encourage people to leave the situation, that it's not safe. They want them to say, not let their spouse have the power over them to say, well, you don't have any papers, so you, I can do what I want to you. They, the laws really do want to work with those people. Um, also for juveniles, we've seen a lot of juveniles who cross the border um, from, from Latin America uh, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico. They're coming here by themselves. Maybe their parents are already here, they're trying to find them. Or they're coming to help their families back home. You know, they're coming, they're under like 15, 16 years old. If they can show that they've come to this country, if their parents, they can't find them, if they can show that one or both parents has abused, abandoned, or neglected them, they can apply to, to get special juvenile status in this country, which will give them a path to encourage them to go to school, to get an education here where they're not going to have to work, where they can follow the system and get their rights, get their benefits, become a resident, become a citizen, and hopefully one day, you know, go to college. And um, Also, I think they mentioned asylum and refugees. Uh, refugees are the people that come to this country after, usually with war. Um, St. Louis is best known because we have a very big Bosnian population um, following the Bosnian War in the 90s. Those people, we want to encourage them to come here. We want to help be a safe haven for them. People that have come here from Latin America who are fear, afraid to go back to their home country because they've been persecuted, because they've been tortured, um, or they have a reason to believe that they're going to be tortured again. These people we can sometimes help. We can get them status in this country as well. Um, and as John was saying with temporary protective status, when earthquakes happened with Honduras in 1998, Hurricane Mitch, right after that, Hondurans have gotten their their status to be temporary, temporary protective status, but that temporary has been over 10 years. We're still, we just renewed it in 2000, the end of 2011, so for another year and a half. So there are ways to help the people, and I'm not going to say that you know our laws are perfect and that we can do every, we can help everybody, but it is important to know that these are the ways that some people can be helped, and there are encouraging people. It's it gets sad when you have to have something happen to you first before you can get any status or legal, legal rights in this country, but at least that's something, and maybe that, as John said, we can expand on that. 
Um, so those are the kind of the biggest things that our agency works with. And we try to at least answer questions for people. If they hear things, because a lot of you know, rumors come out that, oh, this law's changed or this law's changed, we really encourage people to come forward so we can explain to them what really is going on and answer people's questions. Because some people don't even realize that they have an opportunity to get status here. I mean, sometimes we actually have people who don't realize they're citizens. Because they were citizens because their parents became citizens and they never knew it. You know, so those things we try to at least answer questions for people, give advice, and just kind of calm their fears about what would happen. We do know your rights presentations in the community, uh, letting them know that people who are undocumented don't have to answer the door necessarily if the police are knocking. You know, there's certain things they can do that they can protect themselves. Um, so we try to just get people to know that to kind of alleviate their fears. Thank you very much. Now we would like to open the floor for questions and answers. We'd like to proceed by asking you to identify that you do have a question, perhaps by raising your hand. Uh, I see that we have a microphone here. And then if you would so kindly please stand, or if you would like to remain seated, that's fine. If you could kindly identify yourself and then uh, identify who your question is for, if it's a for specific panelists or in general. And I, one other request, if you could please project your voice uh, in, in an audible resonance. We do have uh, videotaping going on, so your question can be captured uh, on videotape. Okay. So first question. Yes, my name is Cozy Wright, and my question is for Christy. Mm -hmm. Forgive me for not saying your last name. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned about the, the humanitarian uh, exemption. Are those the for the federal level or the state? I know each state has their immigration laws too. So. Well, everything in immigration is actually federal. Federal. So it's so a a state, the whole country. So a state can that cannot write anything to override the. <laughs> that's, that's, that's exactly the debate yeah. that's before that's the Supreme Court. That's what the debate right. is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Sondrick and work here at the uh, National Archive. I think I know the answer to this question, but I, I want to ask it just to get on the record. All of the organizations that we heard from are connected with the Catholic Church. Do you all help people regardless of their faith. Yes. Sir. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Cecilia Velasquez. Uh, I have a family who lived here for 12 years. I heard I'm part of the first FM radio uh, in San Luis, the Spanish radio. I just came from a uh, <coughs> meeting that we have a workshop all day with uh, AJC. Uh, Are you familiar with uh, AJC? The, the, uh, Joey's the Jewish Council. Yes. Yeah. So we have this really nice um, workshop regarding all this that you have been mentioned before. And it seems like we're going to start trying to get together and see how we are going to help our community and the Jewish community. and stop the uh, racing for violence, uh, the jurors and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we are going to try to help Mira. Are you familiar with Mira as well? So if you're not familiar with those kind of issues, that organization has been trying to uh, stop uh, some laws that they want to pass. Um, and we need to avoid before that we are going to become uh, the SB 170 in Arizona and the other laws that they're trying to pass in here. Hi, Uh Any of the uh, lawyers in the audience, the state of Missouri, uh, the law of the driver's license, English language, what happened with US citizens that do not speak English? Might just stand up. Okay. <laughs> right now, presently, if you're Right now, in order to get, and this, this has been the law since um, 
since nine, since 2008, part of the, 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 the bill that was passed in his law since then. Um, one of the other provisions, I, I talked about the public benefits provisions, one of the other provisions made it very clear that if you are not lawfully present in the United States and a resident of the state of Missouri, you cannot get a Missouri driver's license. But it, you asked about U.S. citizens. So U.S. citizens are still entitled, uh, still entitled to get a Missouri driver's license, oddly enough. And it's currently offered in 11, I think, 11 different languages. Okay. And, and you don't have to be a U.S. citizen. You have to be lawfully present. So we've heard about the Bosnians, and that's a very good example because the Bosnians were invited here by the federal government. If refugees don't come here on their own will, but they come on their own will, but they don't apply. They have to be invited in by the federal government at, from a refugee center in, in their home country. They're, as part of that refugee process, they're plugged into places like the International Institute or the Catholic Charities um, Refugee Services. And the federal government provides about six months of transitional training. In that six months, they have to, you know, pro process all the whole story that you heard from Jesus. They have to process that, figure out how to exist in this town with no public, very poor public transportation. They have to get a job. They have to learn to speak English. And they have to be, they pretty much are expected to be somewhat self-sufficient after that time period because the funding from the federal government to support them is over. One of the things, I mean, if you've grown up in this town like I have, if you, don't, if you can't drive, you're stuck, right? So if you can't take, a, if your English isn't proficient enough that you can take a written exam in English, you may have a problem getting that license in that six months. So that's kind of the real insidious effect that will happen if, if the pending legislation that says, no, you have to take it in English, you can't even bring your own translator, that's going to be. And that bill, by the way, has passed out of the uh, has passed the House, and 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 in the debate in the House floor, actually picked up some Republican opponents, some moderate Republican opponents, but still passed nonetheless, and has recently been passed out of the Senate committee and will come up for a, a, a vote in the Senate. Unfortunately, probably in the next couple of weeks. Hi, my name is Brian Masudi. I'm a student from St. Louis University, and my question is for. Um, Mr. Schmidt, um, it's just basically, what are some measures taken um, in state and local government or even the federal government to try to break the stigma against undocumented persons here in the United States? Or even the educational systems, whatever. Whichever. Well, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and other folks chime in, please. But unfortunately, I think um, what has happened at the state legislative level has been just the opposite. Um, you know, I talked about this this kind of national movement. It's not a state, it's not a particular organic problem in Missouri that Missouri legislatures are trying to address. I mean, if if you go go down some time and, and, and listen to the, the, the public hearings on some of this legislation and, and listen to the legislator introducing a couple year a year ago, two years ago, there was a human trafficking bill supposedly. Uh, introduced, which went nowhere, thank goodness. Um, the bill actually would make it, would have made it, if you technically read the language, it would have made it illegal for an, in, an undocumented person to drive himself to immigration court because he'd be transporting himself. Okay. This is the kind of legislation that's introduced, and you hear the person supporting it, who's, in, who's introduced it, testifying in favor of this legislation before the committee doesn't understand his own legislation. Somebody gave it to him to, to put into the hopper. Okay. So you, your question was, what is done to decrease the stigma against immigrants in, in, in on the state level? And, and unfortunately, nothing <laughs> much. Um, the real battle, I think, where the, the good things that have happened happen very locally. They happen where you have school boards or you have educators. You have people in the public welfare, in the public benefits um, business that personally understand the issue, that have reached out to organizations like the AJC, like Bob Fox and, and, uh, and Dr. Dr. McDonald, Dr. Uh, um, and the staff at Casa de Salud, um, who, are, have, who, have, who have educated themselves on that. And at that point, um, you know, think differently about it and, and, and engage in their particular roles in a different way. And you, 
you may have heard some of the news yesterday after the um, uh, Arizona argument in the Supreme Court. There's uh, the Secretary of State of Kansas, his name is Chris Kobach. He's responsible for writing a lot of these laws, including Missouri's, including Valley Parks, including Hazleton, Pennsylvania's, including Arizona's. Um, and you're going to hear a lot about him over the coming weeks because he's a friend of Mitt Romney's. And so you hear a lot about Chris Kobach, and he almost single handedly has brought this issue to a lot of communities to adopt. So I'm just saying, watch for his name. The other point I wanted to make that underlies all this. You'll hear a lot also in the debates about the E-Verify system. And I don't know, Richard, if you can talk about that a little bit. Um, I don't know a lot about it except I do know that it has many flaws. Talk to you about the, the Haitians and having protected status overnight. That would not show up in the E-Verify system. You know, if you ran that Haitian's name the day after they had protected status, they're not going to be in the system and a police officer is going to say, you're not here legally, you're going to jail. So, and as Chris indicated, there's people who are here legally that don't know they're here legally. Um, so, I don't know if Richard, can you talk about E-Verify a little yeah. bit? In 1990, Congress passed IRA-IRA, and Title IV of IRA-IRA uh, made provisions for three uh, pilot programs. Uh, E-Verify was coined the basic pilot program, and that rubric has since changed to E-Verify. And it's an electronic system. Uh, you can go to the E-Verify website. As an employer, uh, it's free to utilize the system. And it's a database designed whereby an employer can enter in pertinent information uh, under conforming with the law, INA 274A, makes certain requirements, uh, which was part of IRCA Immigration Reform Control Act of 1986, that mandates employers check certain documents to verify that a potential employee is an authorized alien or an authorized alien for purpose of employment. Uh, among those documents include a document that identify the person is who he or she says that they are, as well as employment authorization under federal law and federal regulations. And so the E-Verify system is an electronic system designed to uh, check the information that the prospective employee provides to the employer to make sure that that employee is authorized for purposes of employment. Uh, as Professor Emmett mentioned, there are, of course, the flaws in the system, and one of the such flaws is a part of the information sharing between the Social Security Administration and as well as USCIS. Both of those entities have a mandate under the you know, statutes to, up, to update the information and to share information. But as you can imagine, with the paper trail, paperwork uh, taking time to be processed and entered into a database, we have bureaucrats who have a mountain of paperwork on their desk to process. Uh, there are delays uh, in entering that information. Also, if a person changes status and they don't contact the Social Security Administration and say, you know, I entered as a visitor on a B visa and I was not authorized for purposes of employment under the Immigration Act, uh, but now I'm a U.S. citizen. I've gone through the process. I've gone from being a visitor to a lawful permanent resident, and now I'm a U.S. citizen, but I didn't bother to update my information. Uh, there may be a gap there in that information. And so sometimes you get uh, results in which a person who's otherwise a U.S. citizen is told, you're not authorized here in our E-Verify system. Uh, what's going on? And so that's, that's just some of the flaws that, that you will hear about. Joel Jennings, St. Louis University. Um, wanted to throw out a question or ask the panelists to uh, project what would happen if a Roberts Court decided at some point to, to overturn Flyer versus Doe in 1984, which basically says that children do have um, the right to a primary education. That's a, an outcome that I think is at some point a possibility um, and a somewhat frightening one, given that we're talking about a population that's going to be about 45 million people by 2050. I was wondering if you, if you could think maybe in practical terms about what that actually looks like for young people who will no longer have access to the primary schools in this country. Thanks. In that case, uh, emanating from Texas, one of the court's main concerns was that uh, you would create basically a, a nation of undereducated or uneducated uh, persons, and that that would be a, con a significant constraint on our social, economic, and political resources. And so it go, it, to change that precedence would go counter to the logic 
uh, that the court established in that case. And practically what you would have potentially uh, are significant numbers of young people moving into uh, young adulthood, into adulthood, who are uneducated, undereducated, if you will, uh, and becoming basically a burden on our social services. And, and, and that sort of goes counter to our notion that here in the immigration system, we don't want people to become a public charge. Uh, give me your tired, give me your poor, give me your you know, huddle masses and yearning to be free. Uh, well, we have to really th rethink if that's really our mantra uh, in our country today. Uh, if we're going to begin to change that approach and say, well, now we're, we're okay with basically creating a, a, an underclass and of persons who really aren't going to go anywhere. They're not going to self-deport. Uh, so they'll become, they'll become a burden on uh, the local and state uh, and federal infrastructures. I have to admit that I haven't been following um, too closely, and I, I will from here on out, uh, the arguments in this case before the Supreme Court. And what are the, it, it just seems to me that immigration has always been a matter for the federal government. So what are the arguments on the other side of a state's rights? Arguments is the 10th Amendment that whatever is not specifically appointed to the federal government is reserved to the states. Can you, someone explain a little bit about what that argument might be? It's a very sophisticated argument and Professor Emmett Mint and uh, the Secretary of State in Kansas, Chris Kobach, who's also an, a professor of immigration law. Uh, he's very intelligent. Uh, basically, it is a states' rights argument, but I sort of coin it as a dormant immigration clause uh, aspect, uh, to borrow from the, the notion of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Basically what you have is that the Supreme Court in a 1976 case emanated from California opined on what we mean by the, the phrase regulation of immigration. And the Supreme Court said in that case that Congress has plenary power, complete power, to regulate immigration. And the court went on to define what it meant by regulation of immigration. It is a very narrow definition. It means to define it, the definition is who can enter the United States, who to deny entry to, and the conditions under which a lawful entrant may remain. So it's a very narrow definition. The Supreme Court went on to say anything that touches upon and affects the life of an immigrant is not necessarily a regulation of immigration. And this was a case that, that looked at the California Code uh, dealing with employment. This is pre-Immigration uh, Reform Control Act of 1986. So that, that sliver, that opening, which was really articulated again in the case Florida Avocado and Lime Growers versus Paul, case also coming from California, in which there was a case uh, which the state of California had different restrictions on harvesting of, of crops vis-a-vis -vis the federal uh, regulations. And the Supreme Court said in that case, not every state statute that mirrors a federal statute is going to cause the Supreme Court to say the states are preempted, the states are kicked out. So the federal government is going to say, we preempt the states. We're the big kahuna. Article 6, National Supremacy Clause. Supremacy Clause says that we trump the states. They're the little <laughs> fish. But the states are saying, well, we have the Supreme Court precedents for Avocado and Lime Girls versus Paul and other cases where the Supreme Court says, if you can have two statutes, a federal statute and a state statute, that can be read harmoniously and they don't necessarily conflict, the Supreme Court is not going to find that there is preemption, that there's a conflict. And so what Chris Kobach, he really is, he's traveling around the country basically telling states, make your ordinances, your statutes, a carbon copy, a blueprint of the federal statute. And what you do, what you do is you create your own local cause of action. You don't have to wait for the federal government to come in and enforce immigration law. You have your own state immigration laws, and you're not preempted because you're just enforcing federal law. The, the, the other side of that debate, though, is, <clears throat> as, as Dr. Milton said, um, it is exclusively in the purview of the federal government to decide who can stay here and how they're going to be removed. The Arizona folks, and I had the same debate on the, I think the JCO show with uh, Joe Brazel, who's the county council <coughs> chairman in, 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 the, in, in St. Charles County, and you'll hear them, and this is the standard mantra, well, the federal government's not doing their job and not enforcing, so we have to do it. 
Well, on the policy side, that's wrong. If you look at the amount of money and the resources spent by the federal government on border security, number of boots on the ground, and internal security, it has grown, and depending on what category you want to look at, anywhere from three, four, five hundred percent over the last 15 years or so. And yet you look at the number of undocumented folks in the country and it's gone up about 250 percent. So the fact that the federal government hasn't enforced the law is, is false. It's, it's made an enormous uh, investment in trying to enforce this broken law, which is what really the problem is. And it's been an enormous failure. One more example, if you look, if you, and, and you all can do this research yourself, go to the ICE uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement website. They, they publish every year a statistical yearbook. Go to the most recent 2011 yearbook and look at the data they have in terms of number of new cases filed in front of the immigration courts and the number of cases actually resolved. Uh, actually disposed of, completed, and compare the two. In the last five years they've been running, they've run, they've racked up a deficit of about 130 some odd thousand cases. 130 some odd thousand more cases filed than what they were able to d dispose of in the last five years, and that number is growing each year. So the idea that the federal government is not enforcing is, is false, but that's kind of part of the mantra. Now the problem and, and, and the issue that really is in Arizona versus the state of Missouri, Arizona versus the United States is the United States argued at the district court level, at the Ninth Circuit level, your, the effect of what Arizona wants to require in their statute in at least four different sections, the effect is that it interferes with our priorities. <laughs> It's, it's not just they have this parallel statute and they're kind of complementing what the federal government has decided. Because remember, here we are, a problem bigger than the resources available to the federal government to handle. So the federal government has, has a prerogative of setting what our priorities are going to be, who we're going to target, who we're not going to target in terms of the whole universe of undocumented folks. That's our priority. And, the, and here comes along the state of Arizona saying, oh, you know what, every single person that you have reasonable suspicion, whatever that is, but that's a different argument, that you have reasonable suspicion might be undocumented. Every single person has to be checked out. Not maybe checked out once they've been arrested for some other state crime. Must be checked out. Okay? That's an enormous explosion of the number of people that now the federal government has to concern itself with when, and for the last 10 months, Immigration and Customs Enforcement in Washington has been telling the local offices, hey, 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 we have kind of a priority list. Undocumented folks who committed murder, child abduction, drug trafficking, we want to focus on those. Undocumented folks who the only thing they've done wrong is they've driven without a license. Prosecutorial discretion, we're going to exercise our discretion not to prosecute those claims in the immigration courts. So this, this is what Arizona wants to now require creates this conflict in how those resources, that's the federal government's argument. One more example, we know um, the, immigration, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, the national organization, represents about almost 12,000 immigration practitioners nationwide. So I have these conversations with my counterparts in Arizona. We know um, Christine talked about VAWA and U visas. U visas are a visa that's allowed, that allows somebody to get status here who's been a victim of a crime and actively participates with the law enforcement authorities. In order to apply to make that application to the federal government, you have to have an affidavit signed off by the, the police officer, his chief, the prosecutor, whatever, the local, of the local jurisdiction where this crime occurred. We know, at least anecdotally, that as, as soon as Arizona, the Arizona bill passed and looked like it was going to become law before it was litigated, all of a sudden, county sheriffs, local police chiefs, these folks stopped signing those affidavits because at least their interpretation was, of the attitude of state law was, oh, so here's another, you know, we have a clear federal prerogative, federal law that encourages victims to have this benefit. And now we have a state statute that actively interferes with that. And by the way, one comma on VAWA, it's not a given, it's a, it's a benefit, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, VAWA is a Violence Against Women Act. It has a whole range of applications for money available for domestic abuse and such, um, including allow, and it includes provisions that allow somebody whose only status here is their application process based on a family relationship to somebody who incidentally is also abusing them. It allows them to continue independently and get their green card. It allows for the U visa, they just talked about the T visa, the S visas. Um, that is a bill that has to be reauthorized every five years by Congress. 
and this week or next week it's up for a vote. So pay attention to that. Two points uh, about what the Missouri legislature is doing. Senate Bill 590, um, uh, which could pass. I mean, the next two months are going to be crucial. What the Missouri legislature does in the next three or four weeks, what the U.S. Supreme Court does with the Arizona case. I mean, the next 20 years of immigration regulation is going to be decided in Missouri and by the Supreme Court in the next couple of months. So it'll be interesting to watch. But Senate Bill 590 has a provision that wasn't in the 2008 legislation that requires you to have documentation with you, and it, it now becomes, under the, if the bill passes, becomes a crime not to be able to document your legal status. Now, theoretically, you'll get arrested, put in jail, and as soon as you get, you know, if, I, if, I, if I'm driving and I left my license at home, I will be put in jail. Now, I'll get out as soon as my wife can drive my license to the jail, right? But if you don't have that, if you're a Haitian and you don't have a piece of paper saying, I'm here because of the earthquake, you will stay in jail. Uh, until you're deported or you can prove that you're here illegally. So Senate Bill 590 goes a lot further, even the, I think further than the Arizona law, right? The public school stuff is further than the Arizona law. It, but also uh, making it a crime not to have your paperwork is, is, is... So let me read to you from Senate Bill 473, okay? So this is where the state of Missouri now joins Arizona saying, Federal government has, hasn't done its job, so we're going to help regulate immigration. The state of Missouri, the sponsors of Senate Bill 473, at least, now believe they can control the federal government. So Senate Bill 473 says the Attorney General of Missouri shall seek appropriate relief on behalf of the state and its officers to compel the federal government to enforce federal immigration laws upon the adoption of the section by the qualified voters of the state. In subsequent years, when the Attorney General determines at his discretion that such suit is necessary and proper, when the Attorney General is directed to seek such relief by executive order, whatever. So the Attorney General of Missouri right now, Chris Koster, would have to sue the federal government for not doing his job. And Section 2 says the Attorney General shall request the state auditor, the Missouri auditor, to submit a statement containing an itemization of cost incurred by the state and political subdivisions due to the federal government's lack of enforcement of its immigration laws. So not only does Missouri say, you don't preempt us federal government, but now we regulate you. And that's clearly contrary to the United States Constitution. My name is Wanda Williams, and um, I wanted to go back to Hernandez versus Focus Christi. Um, critical race theory wasn't around during that time. Uh, could you, Dr. Middleton, speak to critical race theory and how that theory is being used to identify flaws in immigration law? Hmm. I'll address the first part first, and I have to think a little bit about this, the latter part because I hadn't given thought to the, to the latter part. Uh, critical race theory uh, is sort of a dogma or paradigm uh, present in uh, legal studies. Uh, there's also sort of a critical uh, psychological uh, theory or critical psychological studies, but as it relates to critical race theory uh, and legal studies, scholars such as Derek Bell um, advance the notion that you cannot adequately understand uh, legal institutions without identifying the race piece. Uh, how does race interact with uh, legal decision making, uh, legal implementation, uh, as it relates to our political, social, and economic institutions? And so a critical race type theory would ask the question, well, for example, um, I do research as it pertains to uh, the construction of racial identity, and I've done research looking at uh, historically how state legislatures uh, sort of uh, regulated the identification of mixed race, uh, mixed African American, uh, white, uh, or Caucasian persons, uh, beginning with the notion of being sort of mulatto, moving to the notion of the sort of the Plessy, <coughs> excuse me, the, the, the Plessy rule, the one eighth drop of black blood rule, uh, until today. And so those decisions impact potentially how people view themselves when they're defined in certain ways to say, well, if you uh, have any black, uh, any white blood whatsoever, no matter how, um, if you have any black blood, no matter how uh, little it is, you are considered to be uh, African American in this country. Well, that sort of shapes your understanding about who you are as a person. And it also uh, sort of uh, places you in a box in terms of historically what rights you, you don't have. 
Uh, and we, we, of course, know that, that legacy with, uh, of course, looking at Jim Crow, post reconstruction Jim Crow uh, and, and to today. And so critical race theory as it relates to immigration law, I haven't really given much thought to that. But I think if you, if you ask fundamental questions about what is sort of the uh, paradigm behind our immigration policy and the three main approaches to how a person can immigrate to the United States, family, employment base, and then sort of this notion of a diversity lottery. Uh, and then to a lesser extent, uh, those uh, seeking asylum status, refugee status, and those who might be paroled in. I think we make some normative assumptions about who we want to, to come to the United States, who we want to admit, uh, who we want to allow to stay here. Uh, and then when we begin to look at sort of with family-based immigration, uh, our quotas, our, our, our caps, the numbers that we, uh, cap numbers that we place based upon um, per country, uh, and when those numbers become oversubscribed, how there's a rollover. Uh, well, when we begin to look at those statistics, we see that persons coming from countries uh, whose demographics tend to be those who are browner, uh, have browner skin, uh, tend to have longer wait times. Mexico, India, the Philippines. <coughs> and then when we think about those countries where individuals have a very difficult time even coming on a visitor's visa, the Dominican Republic. Uh, I do research in the Dominican Republic and quite often I have friends from the Dominican Republic tell me it's almost impossible, particularly young single men coming from the Dominican Republic to get a visitor's visa uh, because there's a presumption in immigration law in INA 214B that you have to not have the intent to come to immigrate. And it's difficult for them to prove that they're not coming to immigrate because oftentimes because they're single, they don't have ties with family, they don't have significant assets and resources uh, in their home country. So there's a fear that they're going to come to the United States and remain. Well, when we stop and think about those uh, nation states, those countries where we tend to uh, have a little bit perhaps more lax policy in terms of asylum, Cuba, uh, special protections and what have you, temporary protected status, most recently Syria. Uh, we begin to see some, some telling signs about who we deem to be a desirable immigrant uh, to come to the United States. And so I think there are sort of the undertones uh, there in immigration law. Of course, it's not explicit because that would violate a whole, a whole host of uh, factors, equal protection, uh, substantive due process. But there are undertones there, and it, it manifests itself through the implementation uh, of policy. Other questions? What is going to happen next? Hmm. In two months, you are going to really <coughs> There was, a, there was a USA Today article about a month and a half ago that talked about all the unfortunate, unhappy uh, legislators in the different, like Missouri and Kansas and some other states, just grousing and upset because they, and shocked that their, their immigration bills weren't making it through their own legislatures that they even, their party even has a majority in. Um, and the main reason why that was given, why things seem to be stalling in Missouri and, and Kansas and other places, is because everybody's watching the Arizona bill. Um, there are, I mean, Chris Kobach has made three retirements mm -hmm. writing this stuff, selling his services to write this stuff, and then selling his services to, um, to defend it <laughs> and to uh, advise on it. And um, so they've spent a lot of money. And that's been a very powerful argument, I think, with the Missouri legislature this session. Was, you know, let's just wait and see what happens. Um, if, if Arizona is upheld, um, I think those are going to go forward. I, I don't see it's too. I, I don't. I don't think the. I don't think they're done riding that horse yet. I think there's still some political capital in it, unfortunately. And it's it's ugly, ugly, ugly. Um, I, 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 I don't like overstating these things, but you know, I was in D.C. about a month ago, and I, I finally made finally had the opportunity to go see the Holocaust Museum. And everybody should do that. And everybody should think about what happened there in the context of how we're really not a lot, really, the context of our debate, the language that's used in our debate, the language is always the first thing that's used. It was the first thing then, it was the first thing here, it was the first thing in Rwanda, Hutu power, you know, always, and it always leads to very dark, ugly things. And that's not what should happen in this country.
legislatively, I mean, we will have a decision from the Supreme Court on Arizona. We will have a decision on that. Um, the session ends in June, so they'll give us an opinion. Um, Missouri legislature won't reconvene until next year. I, between now and the, and the November elections, immigration reform is dead. Comprehensive immigration reform is dead. The DREAM Act is probably dead. Um, so, you know, what happens after the elections, I don't know. You know, just take a look at the polling numbers on several key Senate races. It's not encouraging. The executive side is probably more encouraging right now. But it's, it's going to be rough. Any more questions? First of all, I want to thank all of our panelists here tonight for coming out. We owe them a big round of applause. Uh, I, I know that just speaking on, <clears throat> for my benefit, uh, I've learned a lot here tonight. Um, as a student of history, as a student of public policy, as someone who served overseas, who's seen Rwanda firsthand, um, it, it's a profound argument. And I, it also unfortunately casts a, a somewhat negative light on humanity in many ways. So uh, it, it kind of touches me. So I do have something that I would like to present to our guests here tonight. So I will do these in the order that they're here. And it's basically, for those that uh, haven't seen, it's a photo of our new building, along with a certificate signed by yours truly, not that that means anything, uh, and Mr. Seibert. My, uh, my so, Dr. Middleton. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Matthews. Look at this, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Jesus. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. concludes our program. For anyone that uh, has any questions about the archives or anything, I'm going to stick around for a little while. But uh, I want to encourage you all to drive safely on your way home. And thank everyone again for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.